Yay! Um, yeah, I'm Tess, I'm famous, and we're going to have a good time. So um, I'm going to talk about the dark sides of machine learning. And hopefully I won't make it too dystopic and make you scare away from it too much, but um, I want to tell some stories about how wrong things can go and how we can make them go right. So um, about a year and a half ago, a couple of researchers, a group of researchers in California created a machine learning model that could accurately, or at least accurately, according to them, uh, figure out if a crime was gang related or not. So <clears throat> taking the police report, the uh, perpetrators and the victims, where they were from, uh, where, the, where the crime was uh, created, and a couple of things like that, um, just basically say if it was a gang crime or not. So, pretty useful. Uh, in the cases where they didn't have a police report, they would simply generate one. Because this was a very forward-thinking paper with using generative neural networks and things. So, what could possibly go wrong with something like this? Hmm. Well, it turns out <clears throat> that if you get classified as a gang member, that's not necessarily a very good thing. And this machine learning model was based on, on this database called the CalGang database, California Gang Related Activity Database, which has a lot of people that are presumed to be gang members. And this um, database went through an audit and had some quite severe problems. One of them was privacy. Um, so local businesses could freely look in here and see if they should hire someone or not, because if they were gang-related, they shouldn't. Um, it also had some retention problems. So a little bit like Hotel California. If you got in this database, you could check out, but not really leave. And then it had some problems in that about 25% of the people in here were not actually proven to have any gang-related affiliations. In fact, 42 of the people in this database were babies, were under the age of one, out of which a full 28 had admitted to being active gang members. <laughs> Duh. Duh. So naturally, when this was presented at a conference, um, like many machine learning papers are, there were some questions. There were some questions about what did you do to mitigate the problems with the data? Um, how did you make sure that uh, you didn't just pick a gang crime because it was someone Hispanic or black living in a certain zip code? What did you do? And the presenter just went like, I'm just an engineer. I'm thinking, um, and actually, when this happened, uh, this guy, Blake Lemoine from Google, who was in the room, he, uh, he gets so flustered and irritated that he left the room reciting a song by um, Tom Lehrer and saying, once the rockets go up, who cares where they fall down? And there's a song by Tom Lehrer about uh, Werner von Braun, who was a rocket scientist in the uh, Second World War. Uh, whose rockets were meant to land on the moon, but unfortunately landed right here in London. But that was not his department. Um, I'm just an engineer. I'm here to suggest that we're maybe not just engineers. Um, maybe we have a little bit more responsibility uh, with the things we do. Because we're put in charge of some very, very um, interesting systems that have a lot of consequence. Uh, systems that um, basically tell you if you should get a job or not, if you should get a loan, if you should get put in jail, if you should get medical care, live or die essentially. So I think we have a little bit more responsibility as engineers than to just say, I'm an engineer, someone else has to take care of the rest. Or as Todd uh, puts it in his tweet, um, yeah, we have a little bit more responsibility. I'm sure being from London, you're very well acquainted with Cambridge Analytica. And many of you have probably seen the Netflix um, show, which if you haven't, 
It's a very good one. Um, so in this case, uh, we all know what happened. Basically, they, they took a lot of data from, um, from Facebook, made personality analysis, figured out who was more swayable, and then uh, sent propaganda to those people. This research, or the research that led up to this, was loosely based on something else by Michelle Kosinski. So Michelle Kosinski, and you might be familiar with this too, like um, a couple of years back, there was a big thing, I think IBM even had a, a version of this, where you could enter your Twitter account or your Facebook account and it would give you sort of like a personality profile because given 50 of your likes, it could tell you who you were better than your friends could in most cases. This guy, Michelle Kosinski, he didn't do this actually for Cambridge Analytica. He did this as proof of this is a bad thing that we should be careful of uh, and make sure it doesn't happen. But unfortunately, uh, just showing that it can happen is something that other, other people can build on. He also created this very controversial paper that's commonly known as the AI Gadar paper. Have any of you heard of this? A few, maybe. So the AI Gadar paper is exactly what it sounds like. You take pictures of people, and just by looking at someone, you would be able to tell what their sexual orientation is. What could possibly go wrong with this? <laughs> right? So looking at, um, so you, to explain what you're seeing here, so this is a composite picture. So uh, what this means is like you're averaging the pixels of pictures and you put them together, so you're seeing like the, the average uh, female who likes females, female who like males, uh, male who like males, and males, or sorry, males who like females, and males who like males. Um, and he said that with very good accuracy, he could figure out, just by someone's face, what their sexual orientation is. Now, um, it had some method problems. Um, so, mainly it was using pictures from um, dating websites, a location where you might be a little bit more explicit about your orientation. But if we think, and actually what it found out was, it is becoming a stereotype detector. So, you can see here, for example, that um, this female uses a lot more makeup, um, this gray thing in, in the forehead is more, more uses of baseball caps. And this guy is completely uh, heterosexual because he doesn't know how to take selfies. So you can see his nostrils a little bit more. <laughs> but, um, so <clears throat> anyways, depending on if you think this could be done or not, if we go in and think about uh, something like this and saying, um, classifying someone's sexual orientation, if we would classify a cat or a dog, something is either a cat or a dog or neither. But what does a one or a zero mean for something like sexual orientation? Is a zero homophobic? And is a one like the leader of the pride parade? And where does like bicurious or bisexual or uh, gender fluid or anything like that fit into this? Obviously, this is a little bit more complex than just a zero or one. So classifying a human behavior as a zero or one, even if it could be done, technically can't be done because you have such variation. And then what does it matter um, for me being from Sweden? If they classify me wrong, that probably wouldn't have a high effect on, on my life. But just a few years ago, um, having something else than a heterosexual lifestyle was classified for books in the library in um, uh, mental disorders. Because things like this, classifications like these, have a very, very long tail. And now, I live in Sweden, but if I would live in another country, it might even be something that's a criminal offense, sometimes punishable by death. So it does have a lot of consequence doing something like this. Speaking of criminals, um, another set of researchers, this time in China, set out to create a criminality detector. 
what could possibly go wrong with that? Um, so what they did was they took uh, a number of pictures of men um, from 18 to 55, and just by looking at their faces, they could determine if they were criminals or not. Excellent. Um, so they took 2,000 pictures of men. Um, a couple of them were uh, criminals, some were not criminals. Uh, out of the criminals, some were violent, and you might think like, to actually accurately classify something like this, you would have to create and like, classify super violent criminals or something like that, some, somewhere where you could really see maybe on someone's face if they were a hardened criminal. But no, a lot of the people that they could classify as criminals were simply, um, like they would do fraud or other petty crime. Um, now, <clears throat> this also had some method problems, shall we say. Um, it, um, when they looked at the pictures, uh, again, of the comp composite pictures, criminal, non-criminal, they found very scientifically that what, what made you mainly um, a criminal or a non-criminal in picture was this triangle up here. Um, if we take a look at that again, um, that's either a frown or a smile, actually. Uh, and the method problem they had was they took pictures from uh, corporate headshots for the non-criminals and government-issued IDs for the criminals. Mm, yeah, we can quite clearly see how difficult it would be to, <laughs> to distinguish between the two. Um, so anyways, they had 90% accuracy. Nine out of 10 times they could figure this out, which was extraordinary because at the time, um, the biggest or the best architecture for neural networks was AlexNet for, for image neural networks, and it could classify gender in 86% of the cases. Hmm, nothing fishy there. Um, so have any of you ever gotten a speeding ticket? Oh, don't worry, you don't have to put your hands up. AlexNet can see it in your face. Um, right. uh, but now if we think about this, because this is another human behavior that's maybe not so uh, one or zero, because what actually constitutes a criminal in this case, and if you were to think about like, how, how would this actually work, looking at someone's face, it would have to work in one of two ways. First time I steal a pen at my office, my bone structure changes, right? Either that, or I'm born a criminal. There's only one of two uh, ways that a criminality detector could work. Still, this is going on, and this is used. Not this particular model, but models just like this one are used. So the question is maybe not can we do it, but should we do it? One of my former colleagues, I, I'm saying former colleagues because we work at the same company, Microsoft, but I've actually never met her. Uh, Kate Crawford, she's now a director of AI now um, <clears throat> for AI and ethics. She said, uh, we're currently in the biggest uh, classification experiment of our times or in human history. It's not like we haven't done this before. Many times throughout history, Aristotle was doing this. But we're now doing it at scale without anyone knowing. And by people, well, who are just not understanding that they're even doing this. And it's making it into products that are actually induced and bought by real governments. This is scary shit, people, right? And the problem is that as soon as we put it in an algorithm, it becomes the truth. So one of my friends, and I'm not sure if you're here, Bill, but um, he went uh, to a hardware store. He was remodeling his house with his wife, and he went to a hardware store to buy some two-by-fours. Got the two-by-fours. They were clearly labeled with the hardware store name. Uh, took them to the counter. The counter, uh, the person at the counter scanned them. I looked at him, his wife, the two-by-fours, and said, we don't carry those because the computer said no, <laughs> right? So even looking at the two by fours, at the people in front of him and everything, he still trusted the computer. 
And to some extent, <clears throat> even I trust a computer like this. Soon it, as soon as it get put, gets put in an algorithm, it sort of comes to truth. It's like a responsibility laundering, because suddenly it's the computer that does this. Um, I mean, we all trust banks, even though we know that the people who are working at the banks creating these systems also have Fridays where they don't necessarily look at the PRs all that closely, <laughs> right? We're just letting it happen. But maybe it's because we trust computers to not have the same faults as we. So we know that people are biased. That's how we survive. That's how we do shortcuts and how we actually get through life. But a computer doesn't have any feelings. It doesn't have any in a bias. They can't be racist. Um, but they do have partially the same problems as us. So, I have to admit, I'm not a big Star Wars fan. Um, in fact, I fell asleep on all the Star Wars movies. I did go, because it is my duty as a computer engineer, but <laughs> I still fall asleep. So I couldn't tell Chewbacca from his wife or his son, because I haven't had a huge amount of exposure to Wookiees. So because of that, I can also not tell exactly what distinguishes them. In the same way, a machine learning model can only understand the things that it actually has seen. And for computer vision, the things that most computer vision systems have seen is this, ImageNet. It's a fantastic database of images, huge database of images, millions of images of searches on the internet. Now, it has a little bit of an issue in that being that it searches from the internet in English, the majority of the pictures in here are from the US and Europe. In fact, there's like very, very little from Africa. And, and the very big countries of China and India have like 3% in total of pictures in here. So that means that when we have a computer vision system, maybe in like cognitive services, and we give it this picture, it shows this. <laughs> right? Um, because that's all it's seen. That's its bias. Similarly, when we look at face recognition systems, um, we have a benchmark that's commonly known as labeled faces in the wild. So this is a benchmark database uh, of Yahoo News images, headshots from Yahoo News from 2002 to 2004. And most um, face recognition systems have been benchmarked against this. Um, now, if you picture who was in the news in 2002 to 2004, it will be 77% male, 80% white, and actually a full 5% <laughs> George W. Bush. And actually, like if you look at the women who are in here, they're either Hillary Clinton, which I hope I don't look like her, um, or actresses, which I could expire, but I'm not looking like her either, or like them either. But um, so face recognition systems are extremely tailored to George W. Bush, which becomes a little bit of a problem. Because when you create uh, systems that are based on face recognition, you get things like this. If you don't train them on enough of the population that you're actually targeting. Or you get things like this, where um, if I go through and I look at myself and my age and things, I'm very happy that it's guessing 26. Yay, I'm not 26. Um, but I'm also not a male which is a little bit of a different problem. Um, this woman, Joy Bulamwini, I think I'm mangling her name badly, but uh, Bulamwini, um, she's doing a lot of face recognition research. And as you can see in the picture, she's wearing a white mask. Um, the reason for this white mask is because she's not visible to many of the face recognition systems out there. It's not like they don't recognize that she's Joy Bulwamini. They don't recognize that she's a person. Like she's too dark 
for most face recognition systems. That's a scary thing. She's doing a lot of research wearing this mask, um, but she's also done a lot of research because of her problems with this on how face recognition works for different, uh, different groups of people. And in 2018, um, early, I think she went through um, the bigger face recognition systems at the time, and she discovered that while they all uh, profess like a nice, almost 100% accuracy in gender um, accuracy, it turns out it's very, very different for different, um, for different people. So um, someone like a light male has like a good 100% accuracy. They will always be classified as a male. But whereas a dark female in the IBM system, for example, one out of three times she'll be classified as a male. Um, OK, obviously a little bit of a problem. Um, a problem that causes things like this. So last summer, or two summers ago, um, they had in London a bunch of CCTV cameras, and they had this watch for, for commonly, like common criminals. Uh, and they went out, they found this guy, um, went out with the SWAT car, patted him down, and it turned out it just wasn't him. Because just like with the Wookiees, these face recognition systems can tell a dark colored person from another dark colored person. Which is, yeah, it's not good. However, some things have been f done to fix this in, in most uh, major face recognition systems. So IBM went out and created another benchmark system uh, because of the work of Joy Bowamini. Uh, that's a lot more diverse and has since helped a lot with the, with the um, for example, with IBM Face++ and Microsoft. Some still have problems and there's a big debate um, and kind of like pie throwing about whether this uh, research is good or bad, but I'm hoping that day two will fix it. So algorithms, um, are just math so they can't be racist. There's a little bit of what I call bias laundering because it's not about the algorithms necessarily, it's about the data we have in them. And it's not just um, images that have this problem. We have this problem in text too. So uh, the way text works or the way machine learning works around text is that we're trying to create some sense of what a word means. So for example, if you have the word peach and beach, they sound very similar, but we know that peach and beach have very little commonalities, right? So in order to do some machine learning and understanding, we need to instead understand the real meaning between the word peach and understand that maybe apricot would be a more similar word than beach. So in order to do this, we look at large uh, amount of data and we find out like semantics. And what you find then is um, sort of like, not a dictionary meaning, but the common meaning of the word and all, all the places that it's been used and the context it's been used in. So if we enter in Google Translate, she's a computer programmer and he's a nurse, and translate that to Turkish and then translate it back, it will show the true meaning of what Google thinks a computer programmer or a nurse is. Because this is the context of this, right? It thinks it, the majority of places where it found computer programmer is male context, so it finds this. It actually also has this for many other things, like he is beautiful, she's aggressive, she's guilty, and then also <laughs> translated. <clears throat> so all of the words have some kind of of like male or female context. They actually also have a lot of other contexts, like ethnic context and things like that. But if something like this causes also a lot of problems. Um, so let's say you have a text prediction system. You start off with this sentence, and then you type in the word he, and then you see what the computer suggests, and it will suggest something like this. Right? The doctor hired the assistant because he was too busy. But on the other hand, if you put in the word she, it would put in something like this. 
right? Because that is the context that's inferring from this. So things like this cause some real problems. Like when Amazon was trying to create like CV um, selector, and it rightly removed things like gender and things like that. However, the wording that we use gives us away. And it gives us away in the sense that it already knew that execute is a very male word, very, um, not very often used by females, and things like that um, makes it then distinguish between what is a good or a bad candidate. So it causes so things like this causes a little bit of a confirmation bias bubble. It causes it to always choose what we've always chosen. Not necessarily because they're factually the best or factually like what it should be, but because we have a bias, we have a historical bias that tells us what, that a computer engineer should traditionally be male, for example. It also uh, causes uh, what we call feedback loops. So feedback loop goes something like this. About 5% of um, the CEOs are female. That's a fact. We can try to change that, but right now that's how it works. So when you see the results for the word CEO, you'll get something like this. Now the problem is that if you get a search result on, on Google or on Bing or wherever, and you, you click, you normally just click in the top 5%, maybe, or the top, like, three, four rows. And the more you click these, the more that will become the truth. So whatever majority you have will be sort of like uh, feedbacked. And now, not only will it go from, like, 595, it will turn into, like, a 99-1 ratio, because you're just sort of, like, automating this bias. You're creating it bigger and bigger. Uh, similarly, if you have a location where you have a lot of crime, and then you go in and you send in a lot of police, and you um, arrest more people. Now, the perceived uh, situation here is that you have even more crime in this area, right? So then you send in more police and do more arrests, and it just goes on and feedbacks away. Similarly to how you always see the same things on Facebook. You always listen to the same music on, on Spotify. You get into these recursive feedback loops that miss, sort of like, um, you lose the, the minority part in this. So in the words of Bora, <laughs> not real Bora, DevOps Bora, of course. To make an error is human, but to propagate the error to all server in automatic ways is DevOps. <laughs> if we translate this to AI, we get this. So bias, like how do we deal with it? Because bias is sort of like an NP-hard problem. And I say NP-hard because there's so many different variables here that no matter what routes we go down, there will always be one more route that we haven't explored, right? So for the words, we could technically, and it's been done and it's, it works, we could remove the male-female bias and we could just say computer engineers are neutral. And that's, you can just remove sort of that factor of the word and it would work. So great, why don't we use that? Well. It turns out that it's not necessarily that easy because there are some words, um, some words, for example, mother, father, they should have a very high like, gender bias. But what about something like colorblind or pregnant or queen? Like, should they have um, a gender bias? And if you, start, if you start thinking about things like that, it becomes a little bit more complicated. And even more complicated when you realize that once you remove the gender bias, you might want to remove the ethnicity bias, which is not just like a two thing, it's like many things, so uh, you have to like slot them all against each other. And maybe you want to remove the bias of like political affiliation and sexual orientation and all these things, and suddenly it becomes a very, very difficult problem. Um, so to give an example 
of another way this is also difficult. If we look at um, a loan and we say, okay, so we're going to create like a, a credit card algorithm, something that should tell us if this person should have credit or not. So we should remove gender and remove a lot of other things like uh, ethnicity and proxies for them. But then we realize that um, it might still sort of like be giving less credit to women than to men because women normally have like big gaps in their employment history, like one and a half year gaps here and there, and maybe two or three in a lifetime, coinciding with um, when you had children. And that of course causes a problem. So maybe we then decide that we should have equal outcome. Like equal outcome would mean that uh, if we have 100 women and 100 men, an equal amount of the women and the men should be getting credit cards. But that would also cause a problem because what if all the females are not qualified and all the males are qualified? Now you're kind of removing um, credit cards for some people that were obviously qualified and giving them to some that were not qualified. So then we might go through and say, oh, we should have equal opportunity, um, meaning that given the, the same qualifications, you should have an equal opportunity. So you shouldn't be penalized for being a man or a woman. But then we realize that all of these things become a very, very political question and not so much a technical question. And we realize that maybe um, while we're in charge of this and while we're responsible as engineers, we also need to bring in some other perspectives and, um, and domain knowledge into this equation. If we don't, we might end up with a scandal and uh, like the Apple card. So this is, um, uh, I think the creator of Ruby on Rails started this for all about um, the Apple card being sexist. And then as uh, the uh, Wozniak came in and he also thought that, uh, and then Wired came in and also thought that. And it might very well be that it wasn't, that the reason why Vosnik's wife didn't get the same credit limit was because she didn't make as much money or for any of the other reasons. But the problem here is that we don't know that. And contradictory to, for example, if you have a normal credit card, you kind of know when you make an application that it looks at your credit history, um, it looks at whatever you filled in, but that's sort of where the buck stops. Whereas if we have an Apple credit card, there is kind of like a lot of thoughts that go into your head that maybe it's also looking at X, Y, and Z and all the other data that I'm giving away to Apple. So the problem here is maybe not the algorithm, but the transparency around the algorithm causing, um, causing this. So not only have do you have to like, sort of take care of the bias and the political uh, questions around it, but also around transparency and making sure that people understand what the decisions are based on, whether they are based on gender, which I don't think actually there was a person at Apple or Goldman Sachs in this case that went in and said, males 10 times the credit history uh, of women. I don't even think that they looked and made, made sure I was a certified rock star developer before getting the Apple credit card. Um, but uh, still, things like this come up because they weren't very transparent. So what do we do? Um, do we just give up? Because it seems like so hard that there is like really no solution to this. Obviously, I wouldn't be here if I thought that. Um, so what I've done specifically is I'm in an AI ethics committee at, at Microsoft, sort of like looking at all the products that we're working on. And we have some specific agendas or specific points that we're looking through for all the products. And the specific ones that we're looking at are if it's fair and inclusive, if it's transparent, does everyone in the, in the process understand where the data comes from and how the decisions are made. With machine learning, you can't know exactly, but you can at least have an inkling understanding the data. And is it accountable? So when something goes wrong, is there a person there or is there someone who can actually say, yeah, you know, um, I understand 
the problem we have, we're going to look at it and like actually fix the problems that come up. Uh, making sure that it's safe and reliable, like autonomous cars and or um, the systems that decide if you should get uh, treatment or not, and secure and private. So these are the five things that we look at. Specifically, when we go through the process, the first thing, and this is a colleague of mine, he, is, he says, what is the worst possible headline? What could possibly go wrong with this? This is the first question we always ask ourselves about any machine learning product that we work on. So that at least we have a base, and this is like where we get like super creative about things that could pot potentially go wrong. Because then you have to decide, are they worth it? Uh, and if they are worth it, because in some cases you actually do uh, want something for the benefits it gives, but you have to mitigate the problems that, it, that might arise. Um, so for example, some problems are quite easy to spot. Um, should you have a credit card system based on social ratings, or should you have a criminality detector? I think sort of like the Black Mirror episodes write themselves. Um, so in my mind, that's an obvious no. But then you have some things like this. You have, um, should you have something that spots uh, cancer, like tells you if it's benign or malign? And obviously, the problem with this is that if you get it wrong, it's fatal. It's like very dangerous to get this wrong. But it's also sometimes very dangerous to not have this system at all. So in that case, you have to figure out how you can sort of take that and say, OK, so we're obviously not going to do an automated um, system. Instead, we should have something maybe that speeds up the process or helps the doctors, but always keeping a human in the loop or a pigeon in the loop, as you see fit. Um, and then you have uh, some things that you go, I, I can't see what could possibly go wrong with this. Um, like for example, oh wait, sorry, uh, yes, creating an uh, object detector, like something that you take in a picture and it says, it's a cat, it's a dog. Like you know, it's for fun. Uh, until you end up with this situation, right? And I don't think anyone, and I don't think we can be sure of that no one has made this label or even thought to put this label in there. But in a case like that, you still have to have a rapid response system to understand how to fix this. Because obviously this was very involuntary, but also very consequential. So, understanding the problem. Then we have the historical and uh, data, and the historical data might contain uh, biases that we can either um, want or not want. So in a case like this, um, we might say, OK, so we know that 5% of CEOs are women and the rest are men. Um, and that's our past, but that might, we might not want to make that our future. So in a case like that, we might go in and infuse uh, you know, some um, some infused, um, do you call them infused women? <laughs> Whatever. Like infusing a few women in this search result to make sure we don't run into that runaway feedback loop. Or in the case of Spotify, maybe sometimes suggesting something that's a little bit off to keep things interesting. In fact, with Spotify, they have a really interesting historical problem. So over Christmas, um, I'm guessing I was not the only one to listen to Mariah Carey. But I'm also, like, after the 25th, I'm not a big Mariah Carey fan, I'm sorry to say. So I don't want my whole, sort of like, everything on Spotify to be Mariah Carey from then on. So there's history, and there's history in the short term. So we have to be conscious about what our history tells us and not just sort of go on that. Um, some other things that are quite obvious is, for example, if you do a, a house price estimator and then two years later um, some law was passed, then the house price estimator is not working anymore. So your historical data is not working, so you have to fix for that. But in this case, you can do uh, something political or you can do something technical against it. Um, and then, even if your data would be perfect, 
you might still have selection bias. So selection bias is probably the most common way to introduce a problem in a machine learning system. Selection bias means that we're obviously not going to sample the whole world for anything. Um, so as an example, um, this was an application that um, was supposed to fix potholes. This was in 2011, and I put this here for reference because uh, what they did was they had an app on iPhone, um, and it would sort of like sense when you were driving uh, on the street, and if it was um, vibrating or if it was moving a lot, it would sense a pothole and it would report it back. And it was great. Um, however, it only found potholes in the very rich districts of Boston. Any guesses on why? Maybe, hmm, yeah, because maybe the iPhones were sort of like in that particular area. So you sampling, like how you sample makes a lot of difference. If you're standing outside of a retirement home or if you're standing outside of a daycare center and do a poll, you'll probably get a lot different results as far as like how you should use your tax money. And similarly, the way we've sampled ImageNet is a problem. So every sampling we do will introduce the bias of the people doing the sampling, but also sort of like the available data that we have. So one way that um, we can work with this is by actually documenting how we did things and the limitations of, of these um, data sets. Um, and then we go to uh, uh, select features and proxies. So we looked at crime, for example, and saying that an arrest means crime is using a proxy. You might think that arrest equals crime, and uh, in a lot of cases, maybe it does, but there are also some crimes that never go, uh, get, like some criminals that never get arrested, and some criminals, some non-criminals that do get arrested. So the arrest is a lot, of the bio, a lot in the bias of police people in the areas that you live in and things like that. Similarly, if you look at uh, a diagnosis that's in the bias of a doctor. So using something like a proxy like that will also change your system a lot. Um, and then we have the models. So choosing a model, you can uh, either choose a very simple model, and in a very simple model you'll end up with a problem that if 95% of your computer engineers are male, then all of your computer engineers are male. But if you choose something that is like a little bit too complex, it will learn like the exact thing you taught it. So it will not generalize well. So if you ask uh, what color is lemon, it might say yellow. And then you ask which color is lemon, and it might give you a totally different answer, although you're sort of asking the same question. And then you might ask which color is lemon, and just chose grayscale. <laughs> Um, right, so um, the next thing is evaluation. So we've already seen problems with evaluation uh, with the benchmark systems. But there's also, so you can uh, actually fix this a little bit by uh, using tools like the Google What If tool that allows you to slice the data by different things. So slice the data by gender and make sure you get the results, like a similar result for for the genders or for ethnicity and things like that. But you also have different measuring problems. So let's say you have a, a problem like this. You have, you're going to create a fraud detector and you have a system that has, for every thousand transactions, it has one fraud transaction. Now, if you wanted to have 99.9% .9 accuracy on your machine learning model, you could simply write this, <laughs> right? Yay! Yay! So this kind of proves how easy it is to fool the system. And this is what will happen. This is what a machine learning model will actually learn um, if you just go by accuracy. Obviously, here, you want to slice it nicely and want to make sure that the accuracy for the fraud is high, et cetera. But this is sort of like how the problems creep in. Um, like the label faces in the wild problems. And then there is the way that you use uh, the systems. So 
uh, sometimes when you use the system, uh, you might have a problem that you're giving away things that you shouldn't necessarily give away. So um, just because you've learned something, it doesn't necessarily mean that you should show it. So let's say, for example, you do an autocorrect system. It will learn from everything you type, and it might be a little bit consequential if it always shows the things that you normally type in the wrong context. Or also something like this, where it correctly learned that his teenager was pregnant, but maybe she didn't necessarily wa wanted to give that away to her parents in the newsletter from Target. So you have to think a little bit about how your technology could be used and how it will be used. Um, so one big thing that a lot of people are talking about is this perpetual uh, lineup thing, the, using the CCTV cameras and using face detection to automatically find criminals, person of interest style. I, for one, think that this is a very scary thing that is happening because um, it kind of limits us in, in our growth as a society. And what I mean by that is, for example, if you, if you look at first teenagers, if you control and see wherever they go, who they are with, how are they possibly going to rebel and understand themselves and grow and become bigger people? Because people have to be able to make mistakes. And people have to, like society might change. So if we would have had a system where everything was controlled and criminals were sort of like caught on sight a number of years ago, then um, having like um, having a gay relationship would be would not be something that we could have right now. Um, or if you're into that, like um, uh, smoking pot in the U.S. because that would have been caught and still and like no one could ever rebel and create new ways of thinking. Um, so I think. If you're creating, if you have a system, um, something that could be used like that in a totalitarian way, you also need to make sure that it's not used like that. So as a bigger company or a bigger player, you have to put your stakes down and say that this is not how we should use it. Specifically also knowing that it has these biases, it has these problems that will make things worse for a certain population or minorities in the system. Likewise, I'm sure you've seen um, uh, deep fakes. Deep fakes are basically creating videos where you can make someone look like they're saying something that they're not actually saying. So, a quite an easy way to create uh, fake news. So, I'm happy that the Big Five got together and um, posted a very big, uh, healthy sum of money to the people that could mitigate this and sort of like find these deep fakes. Um, another thing uh, that I think is important in this is to have diverse teams. So have someone that actually speaks up because it's not always to put your, easy to put yourself in someone else's shoes and understand like all the different possibilities that could come up. Like for example, when Facebook created a system for uh, saying which names were okay or not, and didn't necessarily think that um, long names containing proper nouns were appropriate, this happens. Or when car manufacturers don't really think of women as drivers and don't have crash test dummies that, that are appropriate size for women. In fact, up to 2003, <coughs> there was no female crash test dummies. Um, and what would we do if um, we didn't have any British people in our teams? Someone who could tell us if we should pour the milk first or second. Um, yeah, so, and then we also need to understand that no matter what we do, errors will creep up. Things will happen. So, in this case, obviously they thought, what could possibly go wrong with this? Um, or maybe, someone, maybe no one thought that. Um, but they use um, face recognition technology to, to send jaywalkers texts. Perfect. Like you don't even have to have a police in the loop in there. But then this happens. 
like this lady was on the, on the bus, she gets a lot of tickets. Um, so obviously then you have to have a system to, to fix that. But after all is said and done, and if you look at all these things and, um, and try to fix them as best as you can, the one thing I want to leave you with is that just like all these people, Joey Bolomini or Chris Wiley, all these, when you see something wrong or something that doesn't fit or something that just feels like they should have really thought what, what the heck could go wrong with this, speak up. Because we're not just engineers. We are the guardians of our future. Thank you. <laughs>